Hello, and welcome to Nashville Retrospect Conversations. I'm your host, Alan Forkham, and I'm also the editor and publisher of the Nashville Retrospect. Now, as I mentioned in the first episode, uh, you can learn about the retrospect at Nashville uh, nashvilleretrospect.com. We publish newspapers for 11 and a half years. Here's a sample of one that you can buy. It has coverage of the uh, 1912 reservoir break that we're going to be talking about today. We also have a Nashville history map, which you can see in the wall on the wall back here, a podcast, an email newsletter, and lots of ways to learn more about Nashville history. So be sure to visit NashvilleRetrospect.com. Now for this episode, I wanted to cover yet another topic that I haven't had a chance to spend much time uh, researching for the uh, newspaper and uh, the other retrospect items. Uh, I did a few years ago a presentation about the flooding history of Nashville and have also done some other river presentations. And uh, while I was doing that, I learned that uh, when I used to live downtown in riverfront apartments, that I was very close to where quite a bit of Nashville history had taken place. Um, and it made me start to get a deeper appreciation for what uh, has gone on in the city's past in regard to waterworks and sewer systems. So that, that is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, both systems, I think it's easy to say that we take for granted, like a lot of modern conveniences. We do not have to go down to the Cumberland, Cumberland River and cart buckets of water up to the house or buy it by the barrel. Uh, we also don't have to wonder if the night soil scavengers, as they used to be known, are going to come to our houses at night and empty the privies of sewage. Uh, but 130 years ago or so, that was a big concern for Nashvillians, and it was a life or death issue. There's an article if in uh, 1881 that came out that described the many preventable diseases such as cholera and typhoid that uh, could uh, that cause problems in the low-lying areas of Nashville. Uh, there was in the same newspaper an article lamented the fact that the waterworks that the city had at that time frequently left citizens without water for uh, days at a time. But in the late 1880s, there would be some changes taking place that uh, made a huge difference. In fact, we still have those uh, innovations today. Some of them are obvious. Uh, if you've ever driven down 8th Avenue South, you can see the reservoir up there on the hill. But others are not so obvious. Um, if you've ever been to the new sound stadiums, there's a greenway behind it. And uh, you'd be surprised to learn what is under that greenway and why that greenway is there. So to help us to understand more about this early history of Nashville's waterworks and sewer systems, we're talking with the program director of Clean Water Nashville at Metro Water Services, Ron Taylor. Ron, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, when I was working on some of these past presentations, Ron was extremely helpful in finding images for me that I could use for the presentation. So when I decided to do this topic, you, Ron, you're the first person I thought to, to call. So thank you for, uh, for all your house. Now, how long have you been with Metro Water? I've been with Metro about 25 years. I had about 15 years in career before that in the water sector. And you mentioned you had done some work for the state. Is that right? Uh, My first job was with TDEC on the water side. So um, I think a good place to start, obviously, would be at the beginning for Nashville. And uh, Nash uh, water uh, is obviously important to any city. But in Nashville, we're literally on the river. Uh, it is located here partly because we're on the river, but also because of the springs uh, that are in Nashville uh, at that time. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the springs and why they were important to, to Nashvillians then? Well, I think one of the you know earliest issues is the springs attracted a lot of wildlife. And so the early hunters, whether they be French or Native Americans, were attracted to the area because particularly along Lick Branch, you had a lot of wildlife that would be using the salt licks and drinking the water. So that became a really popular hunting site. Yeah, and if you'll notice on this map, um, at the lower left, there's an oval that shows a spring uh, and also the remains of the first fort that was built here, the uh, Bluff Station or Fort Nashboro, as it's, as it's known. That spring was called Bluff Springs. Is it Bluff Spring, is that right? 
That's correct. And it yeah. served as a source of water for Fort Nashburg. And conveniently, they could divert water into the fort and not have to go outside and expose themselves to attacks. Oh, wow. So they just had some system, like a ditch or something that would go? I, I assume it was a ditch, and then yeah. they had a diverter plate that would put water into the fort. Wow. So for those of you who know where Church Street is and where it meets first, that's roughly where that spring was located. Church Street used to be called Spring Street, which is which is where it got that name. Now, that particular picture showed uh, the sulfur spring, but there were lots of springs around Nashville. Uh, this map, which came, was published in the 1950s, showed where many of the springs were located in Nashville. Cockrell Springs in the lower left was at Centennial Park. In fact, there's a... a a display there, or a water feature there now that that um, uses that spring, and uh, just springs were really uh, important. Now, so what all did they use? It was drinking, uh, mainly drinking water. Early in that area, yes, and springs were generally of high quality. Um, in groundwater, we rely on soil to do the filtration and the treatment. The only challenge in Middle Tennessee is we've got so much fractured limestone that as the area developed and you had more and more people, then there was a higher chance that that water might be contaminated. But that wasn't an issue in the early days of Nashville. It only became an issue later on. With more people, I guess. With more people. More and more people. And the second issue with springs as Nashville then developed is the quality of springs can be impacted. Also the quantity, because we live in the land of limestone, only so much groundwater can be transported. So although springs were great early on, as Nashville really started to grow, the quantity they could deliver could be a limitation. And what um, we saw there, the Morgan Park Spring, and that was near also near one of the early fortifications. And that spring uh, was later moved to Worthen Industries. You see here a picture from 1982 of people lined up to drink the sulfur water. Now, I've heard stories about how much this water smelled, uh, even anywhere near this area. People said you could smell it getting close to that. It, do you know what's happened to this uh, to this spring? Is it still there? Is that water still there? And, and what did why did people want to drink that sort of stinky water. So spring supplies and well supplies in Middle Tennessee may contain hydrogen sulfide, particularly if they're located in areas with decaying animals. So you think about all the animals that used to take water along Lick Branch. So it's not surprising that there's decaying animals there that reduce the oxygen content in the groundwater. That then produces more hydrogen sulfide, which gives us that sulfur odor. And I don't really know why over time that was associated with healthy water, but it was. Yeah, because uh, I know the spring, we, like you saw in that ad just a second ago, that people used to um, uh, bathe in it too. The, the sulfur springs there where the ballpark is today was, was a bathing area. Uh, you know, the sulfur dell is what the ballpark used to be known as, and it was, it was for that reason. Absolutely. So uh, obviously this would only work, as you said, for so long for a city that's growing and expanding. Um, eventually they start talking about a better system. So what, what other uh, purpose do you need water for in a, in a growing city like that? So as we start to grow, we have more and more people who need drinking water. We're also building, though, a lot of wood structures as Nashville started to grow you know, near the city square. All those wood structures are susceptible to fires and fires in that area can be devastating. So we need more water to fight fires and we need enough water that we can store it in a tank because, you know, a small spring can only produce so much in the, you know, per minute. If we can store a lot of gallons though, then we may have enough that we can fight and suppress a fire that might impact you and your neighbors. So this uh, first, as we saw in that newspaper article, the first, waterworks we're looking at is begins in 1823. Uh, what, what did that consist of? What, what was it? They were using that same bluff spring that the early settlers used. And they had a steam engine that was installed there with a pump that pumped water 
in old pipe. And this pipe consisted of bored out cedar logs and locust logs that were reinforced with steel. And they pumped that water then through that pipe to a storage tank that was located at Fifth Avenue and what was then Spring Street, now Church Street. And that was pretty much the water system, the first water system. Now, in uh, doing some research for this uh, talk, I saw that uh, there were quite a few problems with the construction of this. They had multiple contractor issues. I think there might have been some technical problems. One article I read referred to it as our unfortunate waterworks. And then eventually, by 1830, uh, the, the, mill, the, the, the thing burns down. So uh, I don't, I, my impression is that this waterworks was, was never quite adequate for the city. Certainly not. And the first contractor who started to build that system eventually ran out of money. And it is said he ran out of money because he failed to estimate the amount of money it would take to cut through limestone to put in the piping. So our first contractor bankruptcy uh, for the city's first as uh, first for the city. That's uh, well, that leads us to 1830 and what appears to be another first. They this I guess there's a, a, an effort to get uh, a second waterworks built. Uh, there's an act by the General Assembly that allowed the city to go fifty thousand dollars in debt to borrow it, which my understanding is the first time the city went in, in debt. Uh, is, is that what you is that what you know, have heard? That is my that? understanding. I think it was recognized in that era that springs were no longer adequate to provide the amount of water that Nashville needed for drinking water and for fire protection. And so they decided to use the Cumberland River as a source. So they located an intake along the bluffs of uh, the river and then put a large water tank up at what is now Hermitage Avenue. So that became our second supply. Gotcha. Um, one thing alert uh, readers of the retrospect may uh, already know, but uh, some of that money, the money used was uh, uh, of the fifty thousand dollars was used to purchase enslaved people. In eighteen thirty one, the city actually purchased twenty four people to as, to work on the waterworks. Now I don't know if it was exclusively the waterworks. I haven't read that anywhere, but here we can see a logbook that. Uh, it was part of the city's records. It's at Metro Archives today, listing the individuals who were bought to to work on this. Uh, and if you'll notice, the second one down there is Jim. I, he may come up again uh, later. But I found this part of Nashville's history pretty interesting because simply because it wasn't that well known. Um, two of the, uh, at least two of the uh, people who uh, were enslaved were married, and we've got a, a record that soon after. Uh, they ran away individually and, and hopefully were able to meet up again somewhere else. But that was a, a man named Daniel who's 25 years of old and, uh, and his wife. And then um, one article I read said that the city paid off the debt by selling the enslaved people except for two. And apparently two were, were kept and worked for the city. And I came across an article in my research uh, in 1869, a man by the name of Jim Butcher is identified as being a scavenger for the city. And um, I think this could be the Jim from earlier. So I'm, I've been hoping that uh, oh. a genealogist will research this and, and maybe because this would be after the we're keeping census records. So uh, maybe somebody can research and find out uh, uh, who more about who he is. But um, Apparently the waterworks were completed successfully. And uh, I, I think you uh, mentioned to me the celebration that happened when, when, that, when that waterworks was opened. Yeah, today, if we've got a large project, we might have a nice groundbreaking ceremony. But when this project was complete, apparently the need was so great that they had a parade of a thousand people that marched from the city square all the way to the new water supply. <clears throat> they had a brass band. They had speeches. They had cannons that fired. We don't get that kind of celebration anymore. <laughs> so it had to have been something really spectacular. 
Yeah, I, I saw, uh, I remember in that article, it, it says even members of the legislature were part of the procession. So that's pretty serious. Uh, uh, indeed. If they show up to join the uh, parade. Uh, and it was a pretty far march. Uh, if we look at where this was located, you mentioned earlier on the bluff on Rolling Mill Hill. Um, that's a pretty, uh, you can see downtown is the, the square is in orange up there. The old waterworks location is the small circle. The larger circle was the um, second waterworks. And the, near the river there, there's an indication of an engine house. So if, give us an idea of how that works. It's by the river, so it's collect, rather than from a spring, it's collecting the water from the river, but that's way down near the river. They've got to use a steam pump to get it up the cliff. Is that correct? And into the reservoir? It is. And the hike they made was not a flat hike by any stretch, because as you go out Hermitage Avenue toward the location of this site, it's a pretty big hill you climb. And that was strategic because you want that water tank that's storing the water to be at a high point so it can provide adequate pressure to the area lower where it's downtown. And so, and so that's just gravity pressure? It is gravity. And it's it gravity. was said that after they put that new system into service, it provided so much pressure that it was blowing some of the old lines, you know, apart. Oh, wow. So pressure is good, although somewhat unexpected initially. So these are still at this point, what amount to logs, wooden pipes with steel bands around it. Is that what we're talking about? The old pipes in the downtown area followed that format. The newer pipes for this system were cast iron, apparently oh, six okay. inch cast iron that went from the location toward downtown. Okay, gotcha. Uh, another thing they noted in that article about the procession was that they did a demonstration where they connected a section of hose to a fire plug and shot the water over a couple of houses, which apparently everybody was thrilled to see. But um, it was at the time, by that time it's cast iron. So that's not the fire plug uh, that I've heard. I've heard that a plug in, a, in the wooden lines used to be an actual plug. Is that true? It seems like the, that pressure, true. but that's true. That's where the term fire plug comes from. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, so we'll switch now to, uh, we've got that waterworks and I, I imagine there were pressure problems. Like if you, if you got far enough away from the reservoir is weaker pressure. Is that, is that right? As you're further away and if you're up on a hill. Okay. So both of those issues can reduce your pressure. Okay. Even today, that's true. Right. Um, so if we move on now, we've talked a lot about the early waterworks. Let's start talking a little bit about the, the sewer systems. We don't have one at this point, or do we? Is there any sort of a, I mean, an actual system? I know we have the lowlands, and if... Um, there was the Lick Branch, which was north of the city, and there was Wilson Springs Branch, which was below the city. You can see these circled on this map here. Um, all the water from the city, which was kind of on a bluff, would flow to these areas, and they became known as, and I guess for practical reasons, maybe receptacles of waste and sewage. Um, the, so what, uh, what was the consequence of that? You know, why, we've got these two natural streams here, but they're basically used, being used to carry away the city's filth. Yeah, there were no sewers to speak of at that point. There may have been like in, you know, areas where multiple houses are, there may have been a pipe to convey sewage from the house to those two creeks. But those creeks then became our sewer system. So essentially they're open sewers. So that's a concern for public health. And I'm sure it was an aesthetic concern because I suspect it didn't smell so great. Right, and and they are the lowlands, which uh, my understanding was uh, uh, would people would live there because it's cheaper property and no one wanted to live there. And I know from the uh, research I did on flooding and in the paper that, that air, those areas always flooded. So not only did you have the filth from the city going there, if it flooded, it brought in debris from all up and down the river. So I'm, I imagine they were pretty bad areas. I suspect that was a really challenging place to live. So, um, and obviously one of the consequences is, is disease. Uh, and uh, we know that Nashville starts having 
problems with, I'm sure, a few diseases like typhoid we mentioned earlier, but cholera becomes the one that's uh, most uh, deadly. Uh, first time is in, in 1833 that, that we experience it. And as you can see highlighted there, it says attention to diet. Cholera is a disease that um, basically dehydrate, dehydrates you through diarrhea. And you just, force I, the bacteria forces you to expel most of the water in your body. It sounds tremendously horrible way to die. I think it's a pretty wicked disease. And it became more and more prevalent in highly developed areas in that era. Because by then in Europe and the United States, we had large cities with large populations. And so we had a lot of waste we were producing. And there was still a lot of confusion, even in the middle of the 19th century, about what actually caused cholera. And when it's not until 1854 that John Snow, a physician in London, first identified the connection between contaminated water and cholera outbreaks. And he became known as the first epidemiologist because he did some really fascinating work to make that connection. But it appeared that the connection he wrote about was really slow to be accepted throughout Europe and throughout the United States. So we still saw cholera outbreaks well past 1854 into the latter part of the 19th century. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's amazing to me. Um, and again, people who are regular readers of the retrospect, I refer them to the a book called The Ghost Map by Stephen Johnson, which is just a fantastic history of Jon Snow and the other people who figured it out in 1854. That's what's amazing to me. Uh, we had a local doctor, Bowling, who published what you're seeing here now in 1866, uh, detailing things that uh, different outbreaks throughout Nashville's history. And the fascinating about this thing about that book that I found, it's available online. Um, is that half of it has some really good information in it. It's, you could almost think they've read what Jon Snow wrote. It recommends burning the bedclothes and burning the clothes and, 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 and whitewashing the rooms with lime. And, you know, you think, okay, that's going to prevent it. But the first half of the book is about not eating fruits and vegetables. And it isn't, even there's even a story about a guy who, ate a cherry off a tree in his front yard at 6 p.m. And by 9 a.m. the next morning, he was in a hearse. And it's just interesting to me. They didn't think those fruits caused the disease, but they thought that it made you, it would be fatal if you had fruit in you and you got cholera, you were, you were pretty much dead. Uh, so it's, it's amazing to me that that's 1866. So that's, um, uh, you know, 12 years after, and we, we still don't seem to get uh, what's causing it. Uh, also in 1866, another thing we, I read was that they burned buckets of tar in the streets and the mayor banned eating watermelons. Uh, so some of this thinking persisted until 1873 when we had the worst uh, cholera epidemic in Nashville's history. Uh, estimates vary from 650 to 1,000 people died and this map shows where some of the worst spots were. And if you'll notice there, those two ovals are following the two creeks, the Lick Branch area and the Wilson Spring area are, are in that. And so it's no coincidence, this disease being spread through contaminated water that it's showing up in those places. Um, so clearly Nashville had an issue to deal with both with getting rid of waste and also um, having cleaner water. Uh, and I think it's after that, uh, that you start seeing some calls for changes to, to happen. Uh, there are newspaper articles about wanting pure water. And so what I wanted to ask you is um, something that I had trouble understanding is they talk about the Nashville Island and the Filter Island. Uh, and they're talking about that providing pure water. And I kind of feel like they thought this was going to be a panacea that would forever clean the water. What are they talking about there? So <clears throat> to the water intake for that second water system, they added a, essentially a steel cage that was 130 feet by 13 feet by six feet high. And then that, in to that cage, they could add river gravel and sand so that the water that got into the pipe before the pump then went through the gravel 
through the river stone and through the sand. So it wasn't capable then of taking out some of the sediment, you know, that we see in the river before it was pumped up to the reservoir. So that's, that's a good thing. It's better than nothing. But certainly that type of process won't take out the bacteria that are causing cholera outbreaks because of contaminated water. And, and so what ultimately, what, what does, I mean, what, uh, and when did Nashville start doing something more serious about, about that kind of filtration? Well, I think as you, you know, recognized city leaders became aware that they had to do something. You know, Nashville was developing southward. So you've got Browns Creek on the south side of town. You know, as you've got more, more housing around that creek, all of their waste goes into Browns Creek. Browns Creek then discharges the Cumberland River right above the intake. So that's bad, especially when it rains and the rain conveys that contaminated water straight to your water supply. So the city chartered a guy named Professor Landis, Landreth to develop a long-term study about what are the city's best options for a dependable water supply. So Professor Landreth was the first professor of engineering and the first dean at Vanderbilt University. And he did a really impressive study, and we've got a copy of that still, that looked at five supplies as possible options for Nashville in terms of quality and quantity. And then he made recommendations that we adopted. He made five general recommendations. The first is because of the topography of Browns Creek, he said, you can relocate that creek. So it goes further downstream in the Cumberland. And then I wanna put the, the intake for the next system about 900 feet above Browns Creek so we can escape that contamination that causes. He said, put the uh, intake pipe in a crib and that way it can be protected against being blocked from floods. Put a 36 inch water line from this new pumping station that he recommended to a large reservoir. A large reservoir would be located on one of the high hills in Nashville and it would be divided into two components. One side could fill and then settle. And then as it overflowed into the second side, the second side would distribute the water throughout the city. He looked at how long it took for sediment from the Cumberland River to settle. And he said that reservoir should be sufficient to have six days of storage to allow that settling to occur. So we adopted all the recommendations. We put in a new, we relocated Browns Creek, put in a new pumping station, put that pumping station connected to a 36 inch cast iron main that pumped it to 8th Avenue, built that two cell reservoir on top of Kirkpatrick Hill, which actually wasn't his initial recommendation, and then allowed for settling in the first cell and distribution in the second cell. The last recommendation that Professor Landreth made was to finally, he recommended the city locate a water supply on the Cumberland above Stones River because that was the highest quality water. It took us 90 more years to follow that recommendation. And so that, <clears throat> that water works is, uh, if, we, if we go back to, uh, the F2 um, map. So that, so we see up in the upper right-hand corner, that's where you're talking about where Browns Creek, we see it moving in there. That's what was relocated. And that's also where the island filter was too, correct? It was. Okay, so they, they build the new waterworks there and, and it gets transported by a, a single pipe all the way to Kirkpatrick Hill or what is today's Edge Hill neighborhood to the to the reservoir there. Is that is that how that worked? That's it. <clears throat> so the waterworks on the river provided no treatment at all. It was simply an intake and a pumping station powered by steam engines. And then it pumped water through that 36 inch main to the 8th Avenue Reservoir. It pumped it into one side where the water was allowed to settle. And then as that side filled up, it overflowed into the other side that distributed the water throughout the city. 
And so, so that, that okay. shot provides a shot of the uh, boiler house. We use coal to burn uh, to make steam. Mm -hmm. The steam then was sent over to the pumping station side that withdrew water from the Cumming River and pumped it to the 8th Avenue Reservoir. And that is a shot of one of the steam engines. And it's kind of hard to tell, but if you look in the middle of that, there are two round things. And those are the wheels that provide the motion for the pistons that, that are powered by steam. And then that power then is provides a circular motion to the center shaft that runs a pump. And, and so that, and, and that's enough force to go, I don't know how far that is, is a couple of miles? Uh, I don't know the exact distance myself, but yes, I would go three to four miles. So that, that's being, uh, so at the same time, now we're talking in uh, uh, 1888 and 89, I think here, um, the reservoir is being constructed at this time. So this is on Kirkpatrick Hill. This is 8th Avenue, uh, what they call the 8th Avenue Reservoir today, correct? Correct. Um, and here you get a sense of how big it is. Now, what what is it? It just looks like a big round thing, but it, uh, is, it's, I understand it's wider at the base and narrow at the top. Is that the way the walls are it's built? a great shot to kind of explain how that structure is built. It essentially, it's at a large ellipse, 600 feet by 460 feet. And it's a gravity dam. And so at the base, it's 23 feet thick. And at the top, the wall is about 34 feet high. At the top, it's eight feet thick. So the water is held back then by essentially the same type of dam that you might put across a valley to create a lake. Okay. Now we're seeing in this picture the, uh, the divide between the two. So there are two basins about uh, 25 and a half million gallons each and they're separated by a big wall. So you said earlier, so one side is receiving the water and it, and the sediment is allowed to fall out and then it goes to the other side. Is that how it worked? Correct. The water and, goes into the first cell. It has sufficient attention time to allow the sediment in the water to settle out. And then the water at the top is clear. It passes over a couple of weirs into the distributing side where there it's considered safe for consumption and then it's distributed from pipes there throughout the city and what is the house on top of the uh, reservoir that's an old valve house that could be used to control which side um how the how the water was distributed through the piping that came into the reservoir and left the reservoir okay and it, I understand that for a while you could visit it like a park, I guess, and walk along the top. That, I guess, changed. Well, you'd think if, you know, it's eight feet thick at the top, they had a nice lit walkway that, you know, did the perimeter of that structure. But in the First World War, there was concerns about someone coming over and contaminating at a water supply. So then they fenced it off and no longer could you access the reservoir itself. Wow. Um, well, I, I read, of course, this opening and the, uh, I, I don't know if the, the George Weyer uh, pumping station got a lot of fanfare, but I know I did read about the reservoir getting a lot of fanfare when it opened, I guess, because it was so visible. It was kind of in the middle of the city. It was such a huge, huge structure. Uh, but there was, there was something going on with it even or pretty early on. It seemed like, uh, or just within a few years, they're noticing water appears to be seeping through, uh, I guess, but the, the, the mortar and the stonework, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but we've got an article here where somebody was giving a tour and um, uh, one of the people on the tour was uh, complaining or worried about how much water he was seeing seeping. And I think even Captain Ryer uh, answered, you know, what he thought it was. Uh, is that, was that, I mean, we know, what's going to happen, but is that, is that seepage natural Was for a reservoir like that? Well, <clears throat> it's a gravity dam that we mentioned. That's, you know, kind of looks like a dam that you'd see, you know, in any large stream, all dams leak. The question is how much leakage and where is it occurring? 
So it wasn't a surprise likely that there's some water that percolates through and exits the reservoir itself. The concern though is for any dam, as the amount of water that leaks through the dam increases, it may carry sediment that undermines the foundation of the dam itself. And it appears that that's what happened. There's a clay layer that's beneath the stone that uh, formed this reservoir. And it's likely that some of that clay was washed out, which either allowed the wall to shift or allowed the wall to settle sufficient that it lost its strength. And then it gave away that strength on the night of 1912. Yeah, November twelve or November fifth, nineteen twelve. It did collapse, um, and we can see here. It, and and it's amazing to me that no one was killed in this collapse because of what it did to the uh, adjoining neighborhoods. Uh, but the, I guess if there was any good thing about it is that it was a two two basin reservoir, right? And only one side collapsed. Yeah, they didn't get the full 51 million gallons. They only got 25 million gallons. And it did, you know, extensive damage to Franklin Road, uh, what's now 8th Avenue, and multiple structures around there. I think you had structures being washed off their foundations. You may have had people initially missing. And the fact that you had no one seriously injured or killed is pretty miraculous given what it, yeah, the problems it created. Uh, yeah, and a lot of damage and uh, that uh, apparently the city was held responsible for because there are records um, on file at Metro Archives that show some of the lost claims. And this particular one was f that you see here is for a T.M. Henry who lived on at 1502 8th Avenue South. Now that 1500 block is between um, Linwood and Alloway. So uh, he's that those two pages are his, and I don't think those are the only two pages. Uh, he's got a sewing machine for $12 and a pickle dish for 50 cents. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an amazing, now it, it, the one little thing on there I thought was curious, he had a gold watch for uh, $10 was marked on there, but it's circled and it looks like it's marked returned. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess they didn't have to pay for that, that watch. Uh, that damage. So obviously they rebuild it. It's still there today. I I've, I've understand you can see when in the winter when the trees are gone, where the repairs were made. But I, I understand there's been additional work over the years. What is the current, well, what, what, I guess, tell us what happened to the reservoir after those years and did it continue to be used and is it still being used? So that shot you have there is an interesting one because we, I mentioned that as water filled in one side and it allowed to settle, it overflowed to the second side. So mm -hmm. opposite of that house with the valves, you see a little you know, indentation, a little slit, and that's where the water overflowed from the settling side to the distribution side. So that's a, a pretty good one. And then you also, in that shot, the reservoir is uncovered. The water's exposed to the surface. So over time, they did a couple of things they put a waterproof liner inside each side of the reservoir so that water could no longer recede through the walls itself. And then they also then covered the reservoir. They put a liner-like material over each side so that you couldn't have surface contamination impacting our drinking water. So that's what you, if you, I think if you look on Google View today, that's what you're looking at is actually a cover. You're not seeing directly into the water anymore. It's correct. Covered. Yeah. And you're likely, if it's a fairly recent shot, only seeing one side full. We have one side of that reservoir down because we have a project about to initiate. It's going to change how we store water inside that 8th Avenue reservoir. And, and what is that? Is that something you can talk about or describe? I can. <clears throat> you know, with the concerns, you know, over the last hundred years about water pressure pushing against the walls of that reservoir and also the fact that that's what reservoir stores more water than we really need. We're going to put a tank inside the tank. We're going to put a steel cylindrical tank inside the 8th Avenue reservoir. 
that will store the water and there'll be no force impacted against the walls of the reservoir itself. So we'll have actual, an ideal amount of water stored and not excess water. And we protect the reservoir itself. And the best thing, we're not gonna impact the sight lines. You're not gonna be able to see those steel tanks inside the actual reservoir. So it'll look just like it does now. Oh, wow. From the ground. From the ground. From the ground, right. That's From great. the air. Probably <laughs> uh, so that that uh, uh, that makes me wonder too about you talking about how the system's changing um, over the years, and I know that the, the uh, plants have been added to to the system over the years. We've ran stories in the retrospect about water mains breaking downtown, particularly on Second Avenue and on First Avenue, thirty six inch mains bursting in the in the winter. Uh, what what is that? It's all part of the same system. Are those really old pipes? I mean, have been there since the 1880s, or or what? We've got some really old pipes that remain in the system. The pipes that were put in as part of the Landreth recommendations in 1888 were 36 inch cast iron mains. Cast iron was what was used then. Today we use something that's a little less brittle, typically ductile iron. But the cast iron mains are really thick and they're pretty darn resilient. So they've lasted well from the time they were installed and we still use them today. A challenge with those as they age though, is that particularly in cold weather, they can become somewhat brittle. And so the rate of failure for those is not really predictable. It's not like you can say at a hundred years, you better replace it because that's going to fail. It's it's much less difficult to predict when a failure can occur than it is to have a plan over time to eventually replace those. And so we have a plan over time to replace those older mains. Gotcha. Um, and then speaking of older, older pipes, let's go back to the sewer systems here for a, a moment. Um, the, we saw on the we saw on some of the maps the the pictures of Wilson Springs Branch and uh, Lick Branch and how those were repositories for sewage and ultimately uh, great places uh, for to breed uh, disease and bacteria. Um, those start good. Look, those were also looked at differently. And one of the um, articles that I mentioned at the beginning, an 1881 article, recommended turning those into sewers, uh, like, uh, you know, building pipes to, to put them underground. And that start that eventually, uh, that eventually started happening. Um, initially the, it appears to me just looking at maps and, and other articles that I've read, they just would build bridges or viaducts over these just to avoid them. And, um, so, uh, if we focus on the, the Lick Branch in particular, uh, we have maps that show the sort of the gradual evolution of that uh, creek from, you see the on the left, 1833, you've got the Sulphur Spring, which was the, was the, the catalyst for Nashville's birth, really, because uh, as you mentioned, attracted game uh, and eventually settlers. The spring uh, on Lick Branch there uh, is, is saved. It becomes a bathhouse and things like that. But the branch itself slowly gets covered up by street, uh, by streets and bridges. By 1888, uh, you can see that it's just a, a, a little ponds almost, but you can see a pipe going to the river. It, but uh, it's not until 1893 that we actually start building a sewer there. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what that sewer was and how it was constructed and, and the purpose it served? <clears throat> we can. So as you've mentioned, you think about this historically, you had initially an old creek that was fed by a couple of springs in both, case, both cases. As the city grew, you had more and more waste that goes into those two creeks. And so essentially, unless it's raining, you've got a creek full of sewage. When it rains, it's diluted and it pushes it out to the river. But in dry weather then, since it's mostly sewage, it had to be a concern with attracting vectors, you know, mosquitoes, flies, et cetera. 
it's exposed to the atmosphere, so it's going to smell. You know, there's a danger of kids getting in there. So the plan then was let's take those old creeks and let's enclose those. And that shot there is the Lick Branch sewer close to the river. So starting in the late 1880s through 1890s, those were the first two sewers that were built. There's also been <clears throat> what I've read, part of the initiative at constructing the Lick Branch sewer is in anticipation of the Centennial Celebration in Centennial Park, because that creek goes right through the site of Centennial Park. And knowing that there's gonna be tens of thousands of people populating that park during the celebration, it made a lot of sense then to build a sewer from the river to Centennial Park to convey all of that sewage for all of that population during the celebration. So these sewers are multiple layers of brick thick. They start out smaller diameter when you're further away from the river, like at, for example, Centennial Park, and get larger and larger as you go toward the river because you can have more and more runoff and more and more sewage that can enter that sewer. So that Lick Branch sewer, for example, the shot that you showed near the river, it is 16 feet in diameter. And it has, it's composed of seven layers of brick that were installed by tremendously skilled brick masons. And I've actually been inside that sewer. And it looks to me like the tunnels that you may see in the Smoky Mountains, you know, this nice, beautiful curve that's hard to believe that a brick mason could make that. And then you look at the longevity. You know, it was built starting in the early 1890s. It still exists. They're pretty robust. Yeah, and how and, and what is the diameter of it at the river, roughly? The Kerrigan sewer, the large one, so-called because the picture you showed earlier, there was an industrial facility there. Right. That's the Kerrigan Iron Works. And that's why we named it now the Kerrigan Sewer. So the lower part of that sewer at that location is 16 feet in diameter. Okay. Yeah, and I want to point out while we have that picture there, I mentioned earlier I lived at Riverfront Apartments. Well, this is where the Riverfront Apartments are. Kerrigan Iron Works, uh, which is, you can see in this picture, uh, at that building is the, now a parking shed for Riverfront Apartments. Um, and you can see the stockyards in the background, which are gone, but the, uh, the building obviously remained for the, for the restaurant. And um, also just to, so everyone knows what we're looking at, the, the, uh, the LNC Tower is under construction in the background there, which was Nashville's first, first big skyscraper. So, um, so yeah, I've, I've, I like this picture for that reason. There's so, there's so much going on there, but the Lick Branch, again, which was part of the genesis of Nashville is, is being buried at that point. Um, so what's now, also interesting about that shot yeah. is that you had, well, you now have apartments to the left of that image. Yeah. You've got an area in the middle where there's no apartments, there's just yeah. a drive, and you've got apartments to the right of that image. Yeah. And so that's a theme about when you follow that huge brick sewer going from the river toward, for example, Bicentennial Mall. You don't want to put anything on top of that sewer because we have to maintain it. So as you mentioned earlier, one of the logical things to do then, since you can't build across it, is put a greenway on top of it. And so that's a nice shot there that shows the new sound, new sound stadium, and the yellow line is the sewer behind it. And then you'll see openings beside the stockyard, and then the buildings that were damaged as part of the recent tornado uh, between First and Second Avenue. And so there's an opening in those two buildings because you don't want to build a building on top of the sewer. And then at the just below the 2021, on the right side, you see a long line. That's the apartments on the right side of the sewer, a gap in the middle. And then you can see a blue pool on the left. So there are apartments on the left side. And so, and, and my understanding is that, that that's why that, that stadium can never be a professional uh, baseball stadium because it can't be enlarged because of the sewer that's running underneath it. 
Now I the can say it can't be enlarged. The footprint cannot extend much further. I don't know. They couldn't go vertically. Right. <laughs> And like I said, that's historic ground too, which is interesting that how much has happened around there. Uh, that's, that's one of the first baseball fields was, is, is what uh, eventually Sulphur Dell was known as. Now, I wanted to ask you, uh, I mentioned at the beginning um, that in the 18, uh, in the, you know, 18, late 1800s, they're talking about the, the, the pure water. They're talking about sewage contamination. Uh, one article that I came across uh, was a letter from the Board of Health, and they they were uh, that's where they recommended the night soil scavengers, and uh, these guys were charged with were going to be paid to use an odorless evacuating uh, or excavating apparatus to empty all the privies and cesspools in the city. They were paid by the cubic foot of sewage that they were hauling out of people's uh, houses. And they did it between 9 p.m. and 4 in the morning, which is why they were called, I assume, why they were called night soil scavengers. But there, uh, one thing that caught my eye in, in that is that they were to take what they've pulled out and dump it into the Cumberland River. Now, we're also seeing that with these, uh, you know, with the uh, Lick Branch sewer that we just saw being constructed, the sewage is going into the river. You know, that was just the common practice. When did when did we start thinking differently about putting all of our raw sewage directly into a river, which, by the way, is also our source of drinking water? Well, at least in Nashville's case, all the sewage goes in downstream of our water intakes. OK, so nonetheless, we're, yeah, we were creating more and more of a pollution problem because Nashville, especially by the 1950s, has grown to the ballpark of a quarter million residents and all of its sewage is going out untreated. So they started making studies in the mid 1940s to look at where can we locate a treatment plant. And the initial recommendation was not where the central plant is built today, but it was closer to Cockrell Bend where the prison is. And so they're gonna convey sewage all pretty much across the city to a different location. The final and decision, though, changed from that direction for locating a sewage plant to about a mile north of downtown, which is not much more convenient for uh, transmitting that sewage. And then ultimately, that, that plant also included a smaller satellite plant in the Madison area. We call it the Dry Creek plant. And then a satellite plant in West Nashville that's called White's Creek. So we now have three treatment plants. Okay. But until 1958, when the central plant went into operation, no treatment of any of Nashville sewage. Staggering. Yeah, that's amazing. So good thing the the uh, water intake is upstream of those two branches where that were dumping water into the uh, very contaminated water into the river. But still, like you're saying, Browns Creek, Stones River, they're above. I mean, they're upstream of. Uh, of the water intake. So yeah, good for Nashville, not good if you're downstream of Nashville oh, because right. there's several water intakes that are downstream of Nashville. Right. So right. we're not doing them any favors at all. Right. So I there's I think there would be a temptation to say, well, it's 2021, there's there's no raw sewage going into the river, but there it's still a what do you call it a combined system like it's not entirely Exactly. Back when it was first recognized that sewage contamination was impacting water supplies and leading to outbreaks or diseases like cholera, decisions were made, let's get all the sewage away from our water supply. And also at the time for areas like Nashville, before automobiles, there are a lot of animals, you know, that are in our streets. And so when it rains, that runoff is also contaminated. Let's put the sewage and the contaminated runoff in a big pipe and let's send it to the river because we're not treating it anyway. So we finally moved away from that eventually to now we do separate storm sewers and sanitary sewers. So that's a better solution. But nonetheless, the downtown area of Nashville, pretty much from Nashville 
out to 440 and from in East Nashville from the river out to um, along Ellington Parkway about two miles. We still have combined sewers. So we need to plan to mitigate the impact of those combined sewers because when we get enough rain, there's still a portion of dilute sewage that enters the river as a combined sewer overflow. So we made improvements over the last 25 years to greatly reduce the number of those sites that may discharge diluted sewage and to reduce the volume and frequency. But we still have a ways to go. So we're under enforcement action from the US EPA, Department of Justice, and TDEC to spend a lot of money to make improvements to improve water quality in the Cumberland and our new infrastructure. That program of capital investment is called Clean Water Nashville. That's what I manage. Got you. And, and so a consistent theme uh, in reading through all, all these articles about the waterworks and the sewer systems, it, it seems to be an ongoing issue of keeping up with the growth of the city. And Nashville lately just seems to be booming. Are we ahead of the game or, or is, is uh, or, or what do you, what does Metro Water Services have to do to stay ahead of this? I mean, if, you know, a hundred people are moving here a week, which is, or, you know, you hear that figure sometimes, that's a lot of people. What, what is, what is, what do you guys have to do to keep up with that? It is a constant challenge and the way you keep, and we are ahead of the game, but you keep up by continual planning, identifying what is the potential growth what are the weak areas in our system, whether it's drinking water or wastewater collection or treatment? And you have to make plans well in advance because in a large utility like this, we don't plan a project today and build it tomorrow. You know, it takes maybe a decade, if not more, for a very large project to come to fruition. So we're constantly planning, looking to the future and deciding what needs to be done well in advance of that occurring. So our water system is in great shape. We have sufficient capacity for the foreseeable future, but we're implementing plans then to provide increases in that capacity ahead of when it, we may have that level of demand occur. We're also making improvements in the quality of our drinking water, that that's just getting off the ground. On the wastewater side, we have plenty of capacity to treat the amount of wastewater we generate. The challenge we have though, is first in that combined sewer area, the area downtown that has a lot of runoff when it rains. And even in the area around that, that has separate sanitary sewers, sanitary sewers don't age well. And as they age, they leak. And enough leaks and create limitations to our capacity to convey it, particularly during wet weather, from where it's produced to where we treat it. And that leads to sanitary sewer overflows. And that's also a key component of this Clean Water Nashville program is to mitigate sanitary overflows. And we do that principally by renewing the sanitary sewer. We have a cool process. Actually, you can do show and tell here. Sure. For sanitary sewers, we insert a flexible liner. This liner is impregnated with a resin and it's pulled between manholes. The resin then is activated by hot water or steam and it turns this flexible liner into a hard plastic pipe oh, wow. that bonds to the inside of the defective host pipe. So you've got a brand new plastic pipe inside the host pipe that wow. no longer leaks. So that's the single biggest component right. of the Clean Water National Program. That's amazing. So you're so you're anticipating a little bit where the city will grow and trying to make sure that that, that you have you're able to service the area. I guess is absolutely. Yeah. And the fastest corridor of growth in Nashville is I twenty four going from here towards Smyrna and Murfreesboro. Wow, where all the traffic is. Right, right. Well, I called this the early. Uh, waterworks and sewer systems because there is so much to talk about. With, I, I mean, we haven't the fluoridation in the 50s. There's 
the um, the addition of the Harrington plants and then the, the flood and how that affected the system. But we may have to save all that for another another program because I really enjoy talking to you about this and and appreciate you taking the time to to educate us on uh, what I, I think is just taken for granted for the most part. We enjoy sharing. Anytime you'd like to talk further about what happened in the middle, we're glad to do it. Okay. Thank you, Ron. I really appreciate you, you uh, taking the time to do this. Enjoy. Okay. Thank you. So that ends our second episode of Nashville Retrospect's Conversations. Be sure to sign, go to nashvilleretrospect.com, sign up for the Nashville Retrospect Dispatch, which is an email newsletter, and that way you'll learn about the next one. And you'll also, uh, if you poke around our site, you will find the back issues that are available sale for sale. Another example uh, of that is the city plans to de deodorize the river. This is a 1958 article about the central uh, sewage treatment plant uh, that Ron was just telling us about. So thank you for watching. Stay tuned and we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you.